Good evening, colleagues. Uh, thank you for joining us for the next in our series of uh, COVID brief uh, webinars and podcasts. Um, we do appreciate your time and believe that we're meeting our objective of keeping you updated with relevant facts about this uh, pandemic, uh, because we typically have in excess of a thousand uh, attendees and participants uh, in these webinars. And I see from our uh, tab tonight that uh, it's, uh, we're in fact exceeding that total. Um, my name is Morris Goodman. On behalf of uh, Sama, SAPIF, UFFP and Discovery, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's webinar, which we're also hosting in collaboration with the Medical Brief and the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. Before we go into the webinar as such, I'd just like to update you with a few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, we do uh, ask you to ask questions, and uh, please, when you do that, use the uh, Q&A tab uh, and not the uh, chat button tab. Uh, what we'll be doing is curating the questions into topics, uh, and we will try to get as many to as many of those as possible. Again, a reminder that the webinar is CPD accredited. Uh, it typically takes about a week for us to get the certificates uh, to you. Uh, also just to note that the uh, webinar episodes and podcasts uh, are available on the discovery portal in the week following the broadcasting. So this one would be available there um, from next week. Uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, we do have a poll, uh, and uh, please can you um, give feedback on that poll because that gives us guidance for uh, the future webinars uh, and podcasts. Um, I'd just like to then uh, introduce tonight's uh, topic, which is uh, on the front line. Uh, an international perspective of COVID-19 in a London hospital. Uh, and it features Dr. Nikki Longley. Uh, Nikki is an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and also an infectious disease consultant at the Hospital of uh, Tropical Diseases. She's been working on the coronavirus battlefront uh, in a London hospital now. Uh, Dr. Longley qualified from St. George's University of London and then trained in infectious diseases and medical microbiology in London. She has extensive clinical uh, and academic experience in infectious diseases and HIV medicine from her work both in Uganda and in South Africa. Uh, after her Wellcome Trust Clinical Training Fellowship in Epidemiology and uh, Tropical Medicine, based in Cape Town, uh, Nikki took up the post as an infectious diseases consultant and the clinical lead for travel medicine at the Hospital of Tropical Diseases, University College Hospital, London, alongside her role as an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and uh, Tropical Medicine. Uh, the session tonight will be moderated by our own Professor Linda Gale Becker, uh, and Prof. Becker is an infectious diseases consultant, the deputy director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, and the chief operating officer of the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. Uh, she's a principal investigator of the US National Institute of Health funded University of Cape Town Clinical Trials Unit, uh, and Linda Gale, is the, also the immediate past president of the International AIDS Society and a co-chair of, of the Research for Prevention Conference in 2020. So as you can see, we are truly honored to have such distinguished guests uh, at this evening session. Uh, and now it gives me great pleasure uh, to hand over to Prof. Uh, Linda Gale. Thanks, Morris, and hello to the colleagues. It's a real pleasure, and it's always a pleasure uh, to interact with uh, all of you, and of course with uh, Dr. Nikki Longley, who uh, perhaps I'll just put in this uh, this 
note of trivia that she uh, spent her fellowship actually at our unit in Cape Town. So uh, not only a respected colleague, but also a good friend. So Nikki, thank you for joining us this evening. The way we're going to handle this this evening is we're going to um, uh, share some ideas backwards and forwards for about half an hour. We will then open uh, up the question and answer chat room, as it were, uh, to hear what questions you would like to pose uh, to Dr. Longley. And um, we expect to wrap this up round about uh, the end of the hour, but if you are willing to stay on, we'll stay on for a few minutes after that. I know there's deep interest uh, in, most of all, as we um, think about us, our, our own experiences going into this epidemic, uh, drawing from others who've uh, had to deal with the epidemic already. And so, Nikki, maybe we'll start there with you, just to ask you in a few paragraphs to catch us up with the um, trajectory of the epidemic in the UK um, and bring it um, up to date for all of us here in South Africa. Brilliant, thanks so much for inviting me and it's, it's, it's great to virtually be back in South Africa um, from a social distancing perspective anyway. Um, so in the, I mean, I've been involved with this epidemic right from the beginning and we were involved highly in the community screening, which I can talk a little bit about that later. Um, at the moment, we've reached sort of 2, 000, so 233,151 cases as of today from um, Public Health England. Um, there have been a total of about 33,600 deaths in the UK. Um, and that's split largely between England, with it being about 30,000 deaths, um, in Northern Ireland just 400, Scotland 1,900, and Wales about 1,164. So the big epicentre is in England, and the hugest uh, proportion of those uh, cases and deaths have been in London. Um, things are slowing down, so we brought in lockdown uh, in a less uh, sort of full way than has happened in South Africa. So people have always been able to um, go for runs, do social distancing, go out for exercise and go to the shops, but have been advised to stay at home from us uh, um, as much as possible. Um, it's been difficult because we're a densely populated city with a, a, a old public um, transport service. So there's been a lot of transmission that has been going on and we can talk a little bit about asymptomatic transmission later on. The lockdown has definitely had um, an effect and we've seen a dramatic drop off in cases over the last uh, few weeks to the last month. And whereas at the peak we were getting, um, we had a completely full hospital and the intensive care had to change the operating theatres into extra beds and we've transformed the hospital in many ways. Now the occupancy of the hospital is about 25% less than we would normally expect to see at this time of year. So things are coming under control and we're moving into that what happens next phase. Um, I think you know there's been a lot we've learned and I think we'll talk about that as we, we move on but I guess that's the sort of where we're at at this moment. Great, um, thanks Nikki and um... I know that you're very aware of, of where we're sitting, so um, trailing uh, in many ways, but I think what we would like to hear from you is what would you count as perhaps one of the most profound lessons, um, as you say, as you're coming out of things and, and beginning to ask what next, what would you uh, advise to those of us who are on the ground here in South Africa? So I think every country has a different experience and what you have in South Africa is, is you have the, the um, I guess the, you, you've, you've got foresight. So you've seen what happened in Wuhan, you've seen what happened in Italy and seen what's happened in the UK. And I think that that's an, uh, it's an amazing position to be in in many ways. Um, we saw this coming um, and saw what was happening in Italy, but I'm not, I think that it takes time to mobilize and time to get things going. And, and it feels slow in the beginning and then things take off because that's the nature of an epidemic and that's the nature of the epidemic curve. I would use the time you have to prepare. 
and that's to mentally prepare as well as to prepare your hospital and to prepare your resources and think about what you are going to do. Um, what has been the most amazing thing is seeing the collaboration amongst people because this isn't a single specialty disease or infection and it's not something that anybody can handle on their own um, and I think that it's been really really important to try and upskill and try and work out where you need your resources and what is the best way to handle those nobody has enough side rooms enough isolation facilities anywhere in the world to cope with this so one of the things that we brought in very early on was this risk stratification so you try to work out who are your most vulnerable people in the population how can you shield those people from getting unwell and how can you shield those people when they need to come into hospital and then you can have your case definitions because the turnaround time of swabs and the ability to diagnose is not always as rapid or as good as we would like it to be. So we quite early on devised um, a sort of two by two table by putting people into categories at the front door of the hospital to say, this person clinically definitely has COVID and they have they, their high risk at transmitting that to other people. We will put those people straight into a, a, whether you want to call it a dirty area or a COVID area and we would cohort those people together. And you would then say these people are very unlikely to have COVID but the, um, the uh, if they get COVID, the outcome for them is likely to be very poor. So people who come into those high risk categories who have underlying medical conditions, who are older age, who may have a malignancy, who are very vulnerable, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, you really want to protect those people if they come into hospital with another condition from being infected. So those are the people that really need to be isolated in a side room in a clean area. And then you have the difficult cases in between. So you have the people that you don't think have COVID, but they would be more at risk if they got it. And those people who you think have COVID, but they don't fit the definite case definition. So it's trying to stratify people and put them into clean and dirty areas. And I think that that's been really helpful. I think the other really, really, really important thing that um, the our clinical lead said to us is, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And that's really true. And be kind to yourselves, be kind to your team. You're not going to get it right all the time, but you have to really work together. And you need to be able to say, I need some time off. I need to step away because you can't manage this on our own. And often as, as doctors and nurses, we're there and you don't want to let go. There's a little bit of this is I'm in this, I want to get that going, but you have to look after each other and take a step back at times. I think it's super, super important in part of that to just understand the psychological impact that this has, because we as clinicians are used to being able to deal with things where you know that there is something you can do. And in this, it's a disease we're learning about all the time. Anyone who tells you they're an expert is lying because nobody's an expert. It's an illness, it's a virus that has only been around for some months and we're learning more about it every day. And so in some way, we feel helpless. And if you speak to the intensivists, they will sit there and go, this is not like anything else we've dealt with. And all the normal things that we do go out of the window and just be you know, again, be kind to yourself with that and recognize that all the time because it has a big impact on your staff, but it also has a big impact on your patients because they will come in and they will be frightened because they've been told they have to stay at home, stay away, isolate from people, and then they're told they have this diagnosis. And in some ways, for me, it was reminiscent of the, the beginning of the HIV epidemic when people were given a diagnosis that everybody was frightened about and nobody wanted to, to touch these people. No one wanted to come near. So you have this fear from the patients, you have fear from ancillary staff and your own staff, and you also then have fear from their relatives when they're ready to go home, because many people will go home. And I think it's really important to, to deal with that and to deal with their isolation, because you're going to see people who feel vulnerable and who are vulnerable, 
that you're seeing them in PPE. So they don't see your smile, they see a worried eyes and they don't have that physical contact and they've often come into hospital without um, the things that they need to have with them, those familiar things, without a photograph, without any books. And one of the first things that we did was set up a sort of library in the COVID ward because people are there for a long time and it's just having those things around them and I think that that's, that's super important. The other thing that you find with your staff is that they will have guilt. They'll have guilt about being away from their families because lots of people have families at home. Guilt about the fact that they might bring this back to their families. They'll have guilt about being ill and off work and leaving their um, colleagues to manage this on their own. And you've got to be able to manage that with your teams to make sure that they, if they are unwell or they need to self-isolate, they can do that and they're not worried about coming into work and abandoning their teams. Um, and the increasing data that we have is that a lot of people are at least initially asymptomatic or poorly symptomatic. And so there's a lot of spread amongst healthcare professionals and other frontline key workers um, because they either are not sick at all or they feel slightly under the weather. And when you're in a stressful situation, the I feel tired, I'm not quite right, um, is, is this psychosomatic or am I really ill? So we know in a, a point prevalent screening test of healthcare workers at our trust about a month ago, 7% of healthcare workers were swab positive for COVID having no symptoms at all. And that's really, really important to know and understand. And that might, um, uh, have implications about how you want to use your masks and your PPE and how you want to think about your screening and your use of swabs. Um, it's also really important to, to think about those patients that it's, you know, people are frightened of going onto the COVID positive ward, but actually in many ways, that's the lowest risk um, environment because those are the people that you know are positive that is the time you're on guard that's the time you're putting your PPE on properly it's when you're at the front door so whether that's in ED um, or A&E or whether it's as a pharmacist or as a general practitioner or someone else and you have people who are coming in and not all of those will have the classic COVID symptoms so it's thinking about how you manage that and how you manage your resources um, appropriately at thanks. those times. Um, thanks Nikki. I, I, you know, I think those are unbelievably important uh, points and my head is buzzing actually with, with many <laughs> follow-on questions. Um, but one thought I had as you were discussing the risk of asymptomatic healthcare workers is I think we should all rethink our cafeterias um, and our congregant areas in hospitals and, and clinics where perhaps, you know, taking off the masks and, and sitting and chatting could be a very problematic um, source of infection. So you spoke a little bit about um, this being a new disease and, and we're having to deal with a whole lot of new information coming in at any time. But I wanted if you would just reflect a little bit now on the non-pulmonary aspects of this disease. I think we've heard a lot about how the lungs are under fire and um, you know, and should we be ventilating, not ventilating, maybe we can come back to that. But in the meantime, what about, you know, I think we've seen most recently anticoagulants may be a factor here. Of course, the cytokine storm. Just take us through a little bit in your experience of these, not, what are the, the sort of things that catch us out um, yeah. in particular? Absolutely. And I think that this has been really marked in a really steep learning curve for everybody because the case definition still in the UK, if you look at the Public Health England case definition, is fever and shortness of breath and persistent cough. Um, and there are other things that are mentioned in there. But, um, and those are the easy people, as you say, to identify. We can talk a bit about ventilation and things later, but it's the other things to think about. One of, I mean, I think probably the best way is to sort of uh, talk a little bit about what we do know about COVID and then the systems that it can affect. It is definitely a multi-system disease. It is not just a respiratory disease. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen 
in, um, in publications and in the press that it, uh, the, it has an affinity for this ACE2 receptor, which lines uh, bits of the upper respiratory tract. Um, but it also, you find ACE2 receptors on the endothelium, so lining of the blood vessels, in the gut, on the kidneys, in the nervous system, um, and deep down in the lower respiratory tract. And so, there, I mean, there's, it's multifactorial and we don't have the full answer, but where it binds to these ACE2 receptors, it can cause problems. And um, we've seen amongst with the nephrologists have seen a much larger um, rate of acute kidney injury in COVID than they have in other equivalent viral pneumonias. So just having a look at uh, the data is not complete, but it's a snapshot of about um, of 35 patients of our intensive care, 60% of them had an AKI and 52% of them went on to need haemofiltration. Most of that happens late. So it happens about eight to 10 days into their hospital admission. Um, and it seems to be multifactorial. So they have an inflammatory component. Some of them, it will be related to being very unwell and needing intensive care support but also we're seeing this inflammation and direct invasion of the, um, the tubular system, the nephrons from the virus, which is giving this sort of Fanconi type syndrome that you see in other situations. So these patients are losing a lot of phosphate, losing a lot of sodium um, and, needing, and losing a lot of potassium and lead, needing a huge amount of replacement of those electrolytes um, as well. Amongst our general in, uh, inpatients, about 40% of them will have some degree of acute kidney injury. And they tend to be the patients that have a higher early warning score. So the more severe end of people, but not necessarily needing intensive care. Um, you mentioned clotting before, and that's, that's really been a big hot topic. Um, and we've seen a huge amount of clot going on. So lots of patients with COVID have a very raised D-dimer, as well as many other um, inflammatory syndrome, um, inflammatory markers. And that raised D-dimer seems to be very predictive of clot. Um, so of, of the patients, again, I'll talk to our data at UCH, um, of a, a subset of 549 patients that were swab positive, 134 of those were scanned and 56 of those, so about 20, um, so about 10% of those, one third of scans had pulmonary embolisms and further people had um, deep vein thrombosis. So it was a huge amount and what seems to be very, very predictive, both in our data and in, in larger national data is having a D-dimer above 5,000 is almost um, confirmatory of having a clot. So in a situation, if you can do D-dimers or having, mar you know, if you have a clinical situation where you are suspecting clot, think about treating it. What the right treatment is, the jury is still out there. So we know on intensive care, what the UK recommendations are now is using intermediate dose, um, low molecular weight heparin. So that's, uh, you know, so it's sort of a higher than normal dose, but patients are still clotting through um, that. We think there's a big endothelial drive as well, and it's probably multifactorial. In the inpatients, we're doing assessments of, because obviously you're concerned, are you going to anticoagulate someone when they don't need it? And then you have a risk of having bleeds. So we are also trying to do a, a risk assessment of how likely are these people to, to bleed? And are they more at risk of clotting or more at risk of bleeding? And people who are high risk for clot, but are otherwise okay to go home, we are considering sending them home on some form of anticoagulation for two weeks after, because we've had quite a number of people come back in late with pulmonary embolisms, and they tend to be younger people. Um, those who need to have high flow oxygen, who are on intensive care, or who are having non-invasive ventilation, such as CPAP, they really are needing a lot more anticoagulation because they really are clotting. Um, but it's 
it's not the full picture and studies need to be done and studies are being done. Um, and there are a subset of people who have more of a, a TTP, so thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura type picture, and people are looking at doing studies with plasma exchange, which is obviously not something that can be used widely, but it's something to bear in mind that anticoagulation isn't the full answer and it doesn't always work, but it's definitely something we need to know. Sort of moving on to the nervous system. So I'm sure again, there's been a lot of noise about people presenting with profound anosmia, loss of sense of smell and loss of sense of taste. And I've got a wonderful small WhatsApp video of a colleague who um, completely lost their sense of taste and smell for um, a couple of weeks. And her partner blindfolded her and fed her um, a mixture of solids and liquids, including the dried shrimp paste, raw garlic, raw chili, raw curry powder uh, and uh, lemon juice and she couldn't taste a thing and this lasts so that's sort of one mild end of the spectrum we're then seeing a lot of people with an, uh, an encephalopathy so they're presenting with a kind of hypoactive delirium especially in the elderly and they become almost mute and you wonder whether people are end stage dementia but it's actually this um, encephalopathy and lots of hallucinate visual hallucinations so again a different colleague was seeing aliens climbing around her bedroom we had a patient who thought her cat was a lion and she was packing her worldly belongings into a bin bag getting on a plane to brazil in her mind because she was having such profound hallucinations um, and then we see dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. So a lot of elderly people are presenting with collapse, falls, profound postural hypotension without any respiratory component at all. Um, and having this hyperpyrexia and hypoxia without having any, um, any infiltrates on radiology. So you're seeing this kind of dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. Um, and there are case reports of other things going on as well. Lots of stroke is the other thing which fits in with the sort of between the clotting and between the central nervous system thing. And then what has also been in the in the press is this cytokine storm or inflammatory syndrome and broadly speaking this fits into three phenotypes or three categories. So you've got what um, is now very widely recognized and once you've seen a few patients you uh, become very used to this is on about day 10 people will put up their inflammatory markers um, and have an ARDS, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome type picture where they uh, desaturate um, may or may not require ventilation and have a sort of cytokine storm widespread inflammatory process going on. So that is one and the most common. You then see this HLH type syndrome, which behaves like HLH triggered by any other viral or other condition. And it's really important to treat HLH in the same way you would normally. So in the UK, we use anakinra. That's probably not available in South Africa, but it's thinking about turning off that inflammatory pathway and what support is needed. And then a third phenotype that we're seeing being now at the towards the end of the epidemic and um, is this Kawasaki like um, syndrome and it's been seen in a handful of children but we've also seen it in a few younger adults so people in their 20s and they present with a rash a vasculitis some of them have an arteritis and a myocarditis and a terminal ileitis so lots of diarrhea going on there. A little bit of tongue and mouth involvement, but not so much and not the typical Kawasaki hand cracking and rash that you would see um, in other causes. And this is um, relatively new. Again, it needs to be treated with steroids, intravenous immunoglobulin. A lot of these children are requiring inotropic support. Um, and then the biologic therapy, so either anakinra or infliximab, which you may or may not have available to you. But treat the conditions associated with COVID in the way that you would normally treat them. And then the things that are just unique to COVID 
it's uh, the jury is out there and lots of studies are needed. Finally, because I've, I'm aware that I've been sort of talking about this for a long time, is the, the gut involvement. And we've seen quite a few people with, again, no respiratory symptoms at all, prevent, presenting with a lot of diarrhea and vomiting and it taking a long time to settle. And a hepatitis is often associated with that. Um, so thanks, Nikki. So yes, I think we're going to take a few of the questions we're seeing coming through. Yeah. Um, and some of them segue nicely from where you've just been talking treatments. Um, obviously, everyone's very interested about the various treatments. So I know you did a remdesivir study, so we'd love to hear your thoughts of remdesivir. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I've also been asked for you to comment on hydro hydrotox uh, hydroxychloroquine um, and or zinc, um, and I guess chloroquine would also be in that in that bracket. Um, and you've spoken about the cytokine immune modulators, but what about steroids um, in that setting? Um, maybe we'll start there. Okay, so there's, uh, the, the UK has approached this in a slightly different way from what was going on in China and in Italy. And uh, there, was, there were a couple of studies that have been approved nationally. So the big national study, which was approved by our chief medical officer and the government is called Recovery. And what they were looking at in Recovery, and it's had over 6,000 participants so far, is an arm looking at low dose steroids, an arm looking at um, Kaletra, an arm looking at hydroxychloroquine, um, and then there's an arm that has just recently been added looking at tocilizumab, the IL-6 inhibitor. The results are not out, um, but it's trying to look at all, there was initially again an azithromycin arm because that was brought up, but that was terminated because it was, it, it, there's no evidence that that was working at all. So what this is trying to do is with large numbers answer the questions around all of these smaller studies that have been going on around the world which don't have enough numbers or the right endpoints to say are these drugs working or not. What I can say is that to date of all the data that is out there there is no evidence that hydroxychloroquine works for COVID at all and in fact there seems to be um, people are it is not a drug without side effects and toxicities. Um, so there are a significant number of people that will have arrhythmias associated with it. And I didn't talk about the heart, but we can go back to that later. Um, and, it, you know, you can get this prolonged QT syndrome, which with hydroxychloroquine, that can cause um, sometimes fatal arrhythmias. Um, again, the Kaletra, um, there is no evidence that that is of benefit at the moment. And similarly, for COVID per se, steroids, although steroids are being used in a subset of patients that get an organizing pneumonia, because you would use steroids in an organizing pneumonia to treat it um, in any case. So there is some anecdotal evidence that it may work in that setting. But there is nothing strong enough yet to say that any of these treatments are working. Similarly, remdesivir, um, the, the, the final data from the um, Gilead study that we've been involved in is yet to be released, um, and we need to, to watch that space. There has been a lot of leaked data and, um, the, uh, and some sort of uh, controversial publications, should I say, but there is no definitive answer that remdesivir um, is definitely causing a benefit in the small analysis that was, was done, a trend towards um, reduced length of hospital stay and a trend that was, there was a reduced length of hospital stay from 15 days to 11, and there was a trend towards reduced poor outcome, but it was not statistically significant. But the final data is not out there yet. Um, so there, uh, as we stand, there are no treatments that have been proved by randomized controlled trials to be effective in COVID. There are various trials looking at the um, IL-6, IL-10 inhibitors and some of the JAK 
um, inhibitors as well that are looking promising, but there is not yet enough data um, to, to harness that and to say that is definitely what we need. But certainly the biologics are looking more promising than the antivirals at the moment. Thanks, Nikki. That's, um, that's really helpful. Uh, so a question here, and I think relevant to all of us uh, on the call today, is what about protection of healthcare workers? And obviously that involves PPE, and there are a number of questions around that. Any thoughts in particular? And then, of course, um, chemo prophylaxis um, as a protective... Uh, and and I, you may or may not be aware, I know there is a study just starting looking at BCG immunization as a potential prophylactic. Yeah, I mean, I think the amazing thing about this um, pandemic is that everything has a potential effect and it's been amazing seeing the range of, the range of things that are put out there. Um, there hasn't been anything yet to be shown to be successful um, as a prophylactic but you know when you're thinking of antiviral treatment it's surely better to get in there early so watch this space and there may be there are you know talk of trials looking at early um, well so there is a there is a community remdesivir trial um, nothing is published and I haven't seen any data on that and there's lots of talks of trials trials with healthcare workers and looking at various different antivirals but there to as far as I know there haven't been any good data published that we could, that, that I would rely on and um, recommend. I can't comment on the BCG uh, data because I haven't been following that closely. When it comes to PPE um, there's the so the guy I mean this has been something that has been uh, in the a lot around the world and everybody is doing something different. Largely, this is a droplet spread. Okay, so for, in the most instances, it is big droplets and having PPE using gloves and a surgical mask. Um, and uh, if you're doing uh, something that if you're within closer than two meters to your patient and you're doing something that might increase droplets, wearing a visor and an apron and using scrubs is sufficient. If you're doing something that is counted as an aerosol generating procedure, so either intubating a patient, using high flow oxygen, uh, putting down an NG tube or doing chest physio on a patient um, or anything that is more invasive that might gener generate aerosols, then you need full PPE using an FFP3 mask with the visor with the full aprons and gloves. Um, it's really important that you're, you have clear guidance on your level of PPE and what to use and that your staff are trained in putting it on and taking it off. I've seen people who they would have been better off without the mask and the visor because they don't fit properly and they've been touching their face whilst going to see patients. And that is a much higher risk than if you're at a distance in a non-COVID area. So you've just got to bear in mind that your staff need to know how to use it and that they're trained properly to use it and that it fits properly. What we have on intensive care and in our high dependency unit and when we were at the peak of the epidemic and everyone was tired and going in and out of areas all the time is having a buddy system. So by the doors of going into your area where you don your PPE, somebody else is sitting there and watching you put it on and same as you go out, someone is watching you take it off. And it's really important to clean your hands between each step. Um, and it's important to then think afterwards when you take off your, um, your, your uh, scrubs and when you go home, have a shower before you go home, have your dirty crocs or shoes or whatever it is at work because you're not wanting to bring those things because one of the, bring the virus home one of the things about it is that it will last for some time on different surfaces and that's where it's different from some other respiratory viruses so um, I need to remind myself of the data but I think it's up to uh, up to 36 hours on plastics it may be slightly longer on plastics metal 
intermediary a paper was around about 15 hours so it's very easy to, to sort of to forget if you're not used to cleaning your hands in between and it's having either soap and water or alcohol hand gel there and getting really used to washing that and again for people if you're going into an area where people um, are vulnerable and don't have COVID your healthcare workers should be wearing a surgical mask to protect the other people the patients who are the vulnerable patients in that ward rather than thinking oh now i'm out of the dirty area you need to protect your patients as well and protect each other if you're one of those just in case you're one of those people who are asymptomatically shedding so nikki um thinking of those vulnerable um patients and and we've seen a relatively high mortality, case mortality rate um, in the UK, um, presuming that's the demography of your population, that it tends to be um, elderly. But uh, what yeah. has been your experience with HIV positive patients? Because many of, and then it certainly is a number of questions here. What about the person who's yeah. co-infected? So for our HIV um, population who are virologically suppressed, with a good CD4 count, the risk to them from COVID is no greater than the general population and we haven't seen excess problems at all. And in fact, we've had very few of our um, HIV uh, patients admitted with COVID. So it really hasn't seemed to be a problem in that population at all, which is really good news um, for the the, everybody. There was a lot of, uh, at the beginning, um, there was a, a lot of confusion amongst the HIV population because many of them wrongly got sent out the letter to say that they needed to shield, having been told by the British HIV um, uh, um, Association that they didn't need to shield. So there was a lot of confusion and that messaging was not done terribly well initially but we haven't seen um, big problems in that population it's been a problem for our hematology patients so we've had a few people who've presented with acute leukemia and covid at the same time and it has not uh, the, it's it's been really horrible to watch i mean having an acute leukemia is bad enough but having to start chemotherapy whilst having covid is never a good thing so it's been a problem for our hematology and our oncology patients, obviously the elderly um, and people who've got underlying card cardiovascular disease, a lot of problem in people who are diabetics and then obesity has been the big one. Um, so there's a lot of inflammation that goes on in people who are obese and we've often seen obese patients uh, needing more respiratory support, taking longer to improve and being hard to manage as well. So um, another question here about other influenza type infections. You're just coming yeah. out of your winter. We're about to yeah. go into ours. Yeah. And 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 a earlier question I saw. Maybe I'll link it to that. What is the role of other antibiotics? Thinking about secondary bacterial infections, yeah. particularly pulmonary. I mean, this has been a. This has been a. a we've actually haven't seen a lot of secondary bacterial infection. But what tends to happen is in the community, because people, what we try to do is to prevent as many people going into hospital um, as is needed, uh, than, unless it's really needed. So you, I really, really feel for GPs and community nurses and other community specialists, because you don't have the benefit of having all these additional tests. And so you have somebody who is vulnerable, who comes to you with a fever and shortness of breath, and a cough and what you want to do is give them some antibiotics. We had a point at our peak of epidemic where we run out of comoxiclav in London because so much of it was being used in primary care and nearly all of the infection was COVID. We, we did see a number of people that were co-infected with other respiratory viruses like flu or um, respiratory syncytia virus or um, other sort of normal circulating respiratory viruses. And they tended to, um, uh, uh, I guess, co-infection was never a, a brilliant thing. 
Um, we also seem to um, have, there are some people that get secondary bacterial infection, but they tend to be the people that have been ventilated for a long time. We didn't see it very much in people who have, um, uh, are admitted with COVID and are on the ward. What's really helpful is if you have bloods, but typically with COVID, people come in and they're lymphopenic. So they have a really low lymph site count and normal neutrophils and also eosinophenic so their eosinophil count is low. In those patients even though they often have a very high CRP so in the two or three hundreds there's no role for antibiotics at all so often what would happen is they'd come in be seen by in the emergency department they're febrile they haven't had their bloods they look unwell they get given antibiotics and then we would stop them when their bloods come back. For some patients, and often the elderly patients, who tend to come in and with a fever and often something else that's actually caused their admission. So they may, don't forget the common things. So don't forget the urinary tract infections, the pyelonephritis, the, the young person who's at home and may have a meningitis. And that is something that is has been really worrying in this. And so where the role of antibiotics is, don't forget to be a doctor. Although the majority of admissions will be COVID, it's not all COVID. Um, and I think we'll probably go into a bit more detail later about the collateral damage of COVID and, and what we should all do and what we should learn and think about. But we had an, a couple of malaria deaths in London, which we never normally have because people stayed at home having been abroad, you know, before lockdown and they had a fever and a flu-like illness and they thought this is COVID because that's what's going on. So they didn't seek medical care. And it's really tragic when you have a fully treatable uh, disease and people don't do, die from that because they're too frightened to come to your healthcare service. Couldn't agree more. And I'm sure you know that we have almost 200 TB deaths every day yeah. in this yeah. country. And clearly that's the one that I worry yeah, about a great absolutely deal. absolutely so lots and lots of questions about the diagnostics um they have somewhat failed us uh, so far and um clearly you know lots of ideas about how the diagnostics should be used but i'm going to ask two questions that have come up one is the well actually three one is the role of the pcr test um as a screen for for healthcare workers would yep. you do that and how regularly secondly here it's become the practice to get a prophylactic negative pcr 48 hours before coming into hospitals for elective work yep. does that make sense and then lastly the role of serology is it being used in the uk and and you know where where are we headed with that yeah so I'm going to start with your last question first, because that's the simplest to answer. We are not yet using serology in the UK. Just today, um, the uh, a serology test has been um, approved in the UK and watch this space as to how it performs and uh, you know when it gets rolled out and how we use it. But there has not been a, a test up till today that has been good enough to be reliable, so they weren't sensitive or specific enough, so that hasn't been used. So I can put that in a, in a box and take it away. In terms of use of your PCR, it depends where you are in the epidemic. So at the, um, we, at the beginning, we were struggling because we didn't have enough, um, the ability to do as many tests um, as we needed. And, what, and so you had to then use them carefully and think about where best that is to use them. When you reach a point in your epidemic, at the peak of your epidemic, the positive predictive value of your clinical diagnosis is so good that actually for those people who come in with a typical COVID picture, so their fever, their chest um, infiltrates, their bloods that look like COVID bloods, you know, with your um, raised CRP, raised other inflammatory markers, high LDH, high ferritin, doing a PCR on those people is just confirming what you clinically already know. So actually, if you have limited resources, I would say those who fit the definite case definition don't use it on that. 
Also, people who are far down in their illness. So if people who are presenting with this cytokine storm day 10 plus, their PCR may be negative because it is no longer a problem of viral replication, but is an issue of, um, of, of the of dysregulation of the immune system. Um, obviously, if you've got enough, use it for everybody. You know, so I'm not saying don't do this, but if you're thinking of rationalizing your tests and who to use it best on, I think the use in, of it in patients who are going for clean to clean areas, so on the maternity ward and in for elective surgery is good because you want to make sure that people are not infected A, for themselves, because if you're going to get sick and you're having an elective operation, you don't want to put yourself in a more vulnerable situation, but also for the other people that will be in that clean area. So you don't want to infect other patients other pregnant or delivering mums or babies or other healthcare workers. So I think that that is broadly speaking, a good use of the tests. What we did in the UK actually at the, before the epidemic really took off is we canceled all elective procedures altogether. And that's how we managed with our staffing and how we managed with our space. In terms of screening of healthcare workers, Again, it depends where you are in your epidemic and what you're doing. So at the moment, we are people who want to have a screen are doing it, but we're quite low, like the numbers in London have now dropped so much that it's probably not that useful anymore. I'm not sure I can answer whether you should do it weekly or not. You should certainly do it if people um, have symptoms because you want to be able to get your healthcare workers back to work. Um, so it's really um, important to to do that. Um, but yeah, I think that would be my 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 sort of summary. Great. Well, thank you. I think that's um, that's helpful advice again. Um, I, a question here that to take us back into the intensive care to a certain extent to the to the person who's hypoxic. This notion we've been hearing a lot of it of the happy hypoxic. Um, yeah. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that and, and I think it's salient so that you know people are aware um, of yeah. the individual who, who may be deteriorating. Yeah um, so I think that you know people for what one very very striking thing with this is that people often are very hypoxic without having the profound um, respiratory distress that you see in other conditions um, and uh, it uh, so you'd often see people that looked okay and were talking to you on the ward quite well and quite comfortably, but they would have oxygen saturations in the like low 80s. And you'd think, gosh, this person is doing really badly. Um, and, it's, and they will ultimately fall off that medical cliff. And so it's being really aware of that. And no one fully understands why that is, whether there is this central drive to it as well. Um, so it's being aware of that. And I think one of the things that I didn't mention earlier, but wanted to mention, is the importance of doing a treatment escalation plan for every patient that comes in when they first come into hospital. So before it gets into a situation where you're panicked or concerned about them, it's really important to say, how risk stratify this patient, how are they likely to do with any condition, and how, um, what is the ceiling of care and what are their wishes at this point? And so you can then make a judgment of what is best to use um, in that case and whether you go for high flow oxygen. In our um, setting, we use a lot of CPAPs, so, um, non-invasive ventilation, or whether they go for ventilation. And the other hot topic is proning. So we know that that has worked a lot both from the Italian data and for ours, and it often prevents people being ventilated. And in general, ventilation is bad. People who get intubated, they're intubated for a long time and it's really difficult to wean. So if you can do anything to avoid intubating them, the outcome is likely to be better. So picking up on that one, um, I know your country and here as well, there tends to be um, a suggestion of not intubating el the more elderly. Someone has asked here, and I think it's a good question, do you, are you seeing a sort of different constellation of presentations for the, the older patient compared to the younger patient and, and thoughts about that? 
Um, we definitely, I mean, yes and no, I think. I think it's difficult. I think that uh, to, to give that answer, I don't think all of the national data is out yet. So I will be talking about it in an anecdotal way rather than with good evidence and good numbers. Um, we, you, we definitely see a preponderance of elderly people being admitted because those are people who do badly and have more severe disease. And, you know, we, can, we must not forget that in 80% of people, this is a mild disease that doesn't require hospitalization. And in some people, they have no symptoms at all. So we're talking tip of the iceberg stuff here. It's just in a, with a, in a pandemic or in an epidemic situation, it's the overwhelming numbers all at one time. Um, so I don't want to start sort of talking about the rare, weird and wonderful as if that, that is a normal situation. Um, it's not so much that we don't ventilate elderly people in this country, actually, like we often do, but it's just that with this, people who are, it's what is the likely outcome for that patient and actually the majority of elderly people who we have coming into hospital have huge numbers of comorbidities. So we had lots of people with end stage dementia who had multiple heart attacks and strokes before and leave COVID out of it, they wouldn't be somebody who would do well being intubated. And we know that it's not a quick uh, time on a ventilator. Those people who are on a ventilator are ventilated for over a month often. And so the outcome is not going to be good and they have lots of complications. And we've had, we have a couple of people now who they can't extubate at all, who are, um, who are going to have either have to have lung transplants or long-term CPAP or long-term trachea intubation because their lungs have fibrosed and got really damaged from this. So it's not something that you, you don't want to get to that stage rather than sort of saying, oh, we need more and more and more ventilators. It's sort of thinking actually what is in the best interest and what is the likely long-term outcome going to be? Um, Great. Yeah, so thanks, Nikki. I think we're sort of coming towards the end of our time. I'm going to pose two more questions. One I really liked. I thought it was so pragmatic. How do you take notes? bearing in mind the whole, um, you know, so is it pen and paper? How, or, or, or you know, how, how, how have you sort of managed that oh, side okay. of, of yeah. infection control? Okay, so <laughs> we have a fully electronic healthcare system, which is slightly different. Um, the note, bringing pen and paper in, so with our, any studies that we've done, we've brought pen and paper in, We've got, we've written it on the pen and paper. We have then bagged it in the dirty area. We've got somebody in the clean area on the other side to have a clean plastic bag. And you put the pen at that into the clean plastic bag and you leave it there for three days before you take it out. If you are being, uh, you know, wanting to take it out of the dirty area. Otherwise, you have your dirty notes in the dirty area and you use those dirty notes in the dirty area. And likewise, we have one stethoscope or like a couple of stethoscopes that we keep in the dirty area and you clinel. So we've got clinel, which is a kind of disinfection wipe that we use and we leave it there in the COVID area and we don't take it out. We have a dirty cell phone that stays in there um, and sometimes it's kept in a plastic bag and we invested in a smartphone for patients that we keep in the dirty area and it's locked in a cupboard so that they can talk to their relatives so it's it's keeping the dirty things in the dirty place and cleaning them before they need to come out but if you need paperwork out you have to leave it in the double bag thing before it uh, before you unwrap it yeah, and I think those are all great points. Um, we, we, we've been following some really poignant stories about people's last words and their ability to make contact with the outside world. So I think that's yeah. a lovely idea. I mean, I think one, just to, just to sort of touch on that a little bit, um, if we have, do we have time to talk a little bit about palliative Yes, a little bit, if you keep it shortish. I'll keep it short. <laughs> I would say get palliative care involved early. I've asked for permission from our team here and they're happy for me to share their pathways with you in South Africa and all the documents and we can try and adapt those for resources that you have. 
um, it's really important to talk to relatives and patients, the relatives of patients and the patients themselves daily and to try and set up video calling. And if people are dying, we have got relatives to come in. I don't think we've had anyone who has died on their own, but we've tried to do that in people who are in side rooms. So we've saved side rooms for people who are dying and we've tried to get somebody to come in because you often have time to do that and they wear PPE because I think it's something that is super super important it's really important for the person who's dying but it's also important for the relative at home great thanks nikki and uh, perhaps on the the last note to end on is just what what do you advise um clinicians in south africa you're perhaps over the the hump as it were we're facing the hump what what would be your take takeaway message in you know a couple of sentences my takeaway message is, I mean, I would go, but I'm going to go back to the mantra I started with, which is be kind, be kind to your team, be kind to yourself, be kind to your family at home. And actually, I think that we, it's really easy to forget how hard it is for those who are at home and being scared. And in some ways, it's much easier for us on the front line. And it's just the enormous support that we um, as healthcare workers get from our family who are sitting at home often with multiple children trying to homeschool them in a confined environment and think about them as well as yourselves and have a break it's super super important to have a break as well thanks nikki i think that's great and um thank you for being on the front line and taking some time from a really busy uh, routine i know and i'm gonna on that note hand over back to maurice thanks thank so much you. thanks well, well thank you uh uh, Nikki and Linda Gove for really insightful uh, uh, discussion. I mean, there's nothing, I guess, that uh, Trump's experience and uh, really being on the front line and, and dealing with this in real time. So some excellent lessons for us. Um, thank you for that. Um, for all the participants, please do remember to uh, complete the poll before you sign out. We really, we had over 1,500 uh, colleagues participating and over close to 130 questions. Apologies if we didn't get to them all, um, but uh, a great job by Linda Gell, Tana collating and curating those. And Nikki, uh, thank you again very much. So uh, good night to you all and uh, please join us again next week. Thank you.